I served in the Washington Kennewick mission. And I served in the Japan Tokyo mission. And I served in the Washington Seattle mission from February of 2010 to February of 2012. I served in Tempe, Arizona from February 2010 to March 2012. I served in the Mexico Oaxaca mission. I went to the Spain Malaga mission in St. Louis, Missouri. I served in Manchester, and England. I went to Asuncion, Paraguay uh, on June 23rd of 2010. I served in Brazil, Maceo from June 2010 to June 2012. I served in the Chile Concepcion South mission. And I served in the Norway Oslo mission from October 2010 to 2012. Back in 2009, I was graduating from, from high school and I had this, this great group of friends that I was graduating with. And for the next year or so after high school, it was just one by one, we all started heading off on our, uh, on our various missions around the world. I'm just really grateful that I met who I did in middle school and high school and I saw who I did and I hung out with who I did because they really helped me out more than anything. But the fact that I did have friends that were going made it a lot easier to make the decision to go. Once Keaton and Scott and everyone started getting their calls, they said, we're actually doing this. I know it had an impact on me. It made it much easier for me to, to go on server mission when I had all these other friends doing it. And I think the craziest thing was, though, that with this certainty of going on a mission, we, we still had no clue what we were doing. Uh, we, had, we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. My expectations of the mission before I went were definitely different than what it really was. I pictured rainbows and butterflies and that it was going to be miracle after miracle every day, which I think a lot of people think and expect. Uh, and then when you get there, it kind of hits you like a freight train. I didn't really anticipate what was ahead of me. I had no idea what was going to happen to me, so. Uh, when I got my call, we were actually up on trek with my ward. We were sleeping that morning. My bishop walked up to me about 6 a.m. and kicked me and said, "Hey, Scott, you need to get up." And we we walked up on top of this on top of this plateau. He looked at me and said, "You know, Scott, you've you've been a good influence in the ward." And he unzipped his coat and he pulled out my call and he said, "Elder Draper, you've been called. Are you going to answer the call?" I spent some time just to myself, just holding what was in my hand, um, knowing. Uh, that it would, it held a, a lot for me. The first thing I thought when I opened my call was, oh no, my mom's gonna be worried. <laughs> Initially, I was really, really disappointed. I was in shock. Really calm. I was furious. He just ecstatic. It's pretty cool. I felt this this profound sense of love for a, for people that I I hadn't even met yet, and that that let me know that that was that was exactly where I needed to be. Someone pulled up a video of Peoria, a drive through Peoria, and it was like this dirt road with one stoplight. And I was like, this is my mission. I was like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Um, I prayed just to be comfortable and just confident in knowing wherever it is, it was, it was kind of where I needed to be. I had not planned on going on a mission. Um, my parents and my bishop kind of just walked me through step by step. And I always thought that getting my call was the point where I could then say no. That was about as far as you could go before you had to really decide one way or the other. And um, opened that up and started reading from the beginning and read the lines, you've been called to serve in Tempe, Arizona, which is where I grew up. It's been my first 12 years of life in Tempe. And, and I opened my call and it said Norway. And 50 years ago, my grandma was converted in Norway. And I knew instantly that there was no way whatsoever that I could say no, that God knew who I was and had a 
awful sense of humor. The first night down there, I could look out my bedroom window and see my grandparents' house. Uh, that made it a little bit, I don't know, I felt like I was close to home, but at the same time, it was just kind of like I was on vacation. It was really strange. I can't quite describe it. So it was a really difficult emotional experience because that was really the first time I realized I was going on a mission for real. But when I opened my call, it said, you've been called to the Ulaanbaatar Mongolia mission. And I had that same reaction I just had on my face of, wow. It's an original 12 week stay in the MTC. The little white box that was my room. I was in the MTC for nine weeks and I didn't get my visa so I was sent to Orlando, Florida. And then we got news that okay you're not going to you're not going to Mongolia yet. We can't get visas. Okay you're gonna hold off. And then I didn't get my visa. The nine weeks came and my visa didn't come. For the next four weeks we just kinda hung around wasted probably more time than we should have but it's hard to just sit there all the time without any teachers doing whatever you want. So you're being temporarily reassigned to go out to other missions. It really made me question what what I had been doing. Why did I why did I have to spend 13 weeks in the in the NTC? And it was hard. And then I got called to Ogden which I was actually, while I was there, I was kind of upset because I did want to be in Mexico. Like I but I remember that moment that I got a call from my mission president and as soon as I picked up the phone and he said, Elder Draper, I knew from that moment that what that call was about. Orlando and my mission president in Orlando called me and he said, Elder Finch, I have some bad news for you. I was like, oh shoot. Actually, we were doing companionship study at the time, and we get a phone call from the secretary of the mission saying that I got my visa and I need to go to the consulate the following day. And he just said, you're, uh, you're going to Brazil, we have your visa. So I tried to act like I was sad, <laughs> but I wasn't. I was pretty excited. And so then that was it, and then I got my visa and headed off to Brazil. You're not going to Mongolia. You've been officially reassigned, and I got a new mission call from the first presidency. But I knew with a, without a doubt, I heard an audible voice in my head that said, you're fine. This is where you need to be. You need to love these people. And it was interesting to think, I thought about it often of, is that really what I heard? Or was that just what I was thinking and trying to make the best of the situation? But it was truly a, a moment where I knew that I was where I needed to be. You get your call, you have all your family around, you open your call, you find out where you're going, Woo everyone's cheering. You then have a, basically a meeting all about you at your farewell. I know they're trying to cut back on that, but it's, it's still basically all for you. And you, all your friends are there, and all your family members are there, and all these people are there to congratulate you, and you give this awesome talk, you feel on top of the world, you're like, yeah, we're going on a mission. And then you get dropped off at the MTC, and your parents leave and no one knows who you are at the MTC really. All of a sudden you're left alone, you go to bed that night and you wake up the next morning and you're a missionary and all of a sudden it gets pretty serious. <laughs> but if you expect it to be a vacation or you expect to get along with all your companions or you expect whatever you're doing to be easy, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. And I found that a lot of missionaries around me were tried to pretend that that, that everything was okay. You know, they never were sad. They never had a hard time. No day was hard. It's the best two years, right? It's, everything's perfect. It's the perfect two years. Nothing goes wrong. And that's just not true. I was in a car accident within the first half hour of landing because there's cars all over the road breaking down, uh, threatened by somebody to be killed by a machete. But that same week, I was headbutted by a cow. Showering with frogs is not as bad as you'd think. As we walked down the street, we came to the house of a recent convert and we could see flames in his backyard. So we knocked on his door and he came to the door and said, Oh, Elderes, como estan? How are you? He said, Armando, your, your yard is on fire. And he came out and said, Mi yarda! And I was trying to rake it away, rake some of the dead grass out of the way and get it away from the, the car that was only a few feet away from where the fire was coming. And a police officer came, parked his car, walked to the fence, and kind of leaned on the fence and goes, well, looks like the Mormons have everything under control. My first companion, 
Um, I don't want to say it was the worst, but it was definitely the roughest time of my whole mission. Actually, I bet other people were, were stressed when uh, I was their companion, but uh, <laughs> it's okay. But uh... I didn't think missionaries did anything bad or anything, or always looking at the missionaries, you see them like angels, and you're like, wow, like they're just perfect, but you get some missionaries that are just, they're psychos. They are insane. He's like, you know what, I'm done! He screams at the top of his lungs, punches the dashboard, opens the door, and just gets out and runs. And I'm so I'm just sitting in the driver's seat, just kind of watching him run off into the distance. And it's late at night, and I'm just thinking, this is actually happening to me. I remember there were a lot of times before I would walk out the door that I just thinking, you know what, I'm, I don't want to do this. And Seriously, some parts are so hard, and those days when you look at your planner and you see that the next day is completely empty, there's no worse feeling in this world. Learning Japanese kind of sucked. <laughs> that, but I remember going there and listening to them and I was like, there's no way I'm going to understand. I don't understand anything. I had no idea what they were saying. I would sit in lessons and just kind of nod my head and see. Jesucristo. You can just imagine them just crying and looking at my companion and saying a bunch of stuff. And I'm just sitting there, you know, at the emotions really high and everything and my companion just sits there and then he just looks at me <laughs> and I had no idea what to do we were teaching our investigator and she was had a baptismal date and we were explaining something to her and I just was uh, totally not making any sense with my Japanese and she said why are you teaching me because we were there with our uh, ward mission leader and um, why are you teaching me? Why doesn't he just teach me? Like, I don't understand what you say and he has to translate anyway, so why doesn't he just teach me? And I was just like, I don't know. <laughs> it's a valid question. I don't know why I was sent to teach you. But the thing that helped me to go day by day the most was, I would say a prayer and just say, you know I want to go home, but I'm not going home today and I'm not going home tomorrow. So for as long as I'm here, can you give me someone to help, someone to care about, someone who I can really feel like I'm making a difference? And I never had God ignore that prayer. Yeah, I remember one specific um, student, Chinese student that I worked with, his name was Harang Gang. I remember meeting with him just kind of in a park. Uh, and he didn't understand a lot, but I just remember him saying at the end, you know what, I really feel something. And the parents told us, hey, uh, our daughter's dating this guy who's not a member, and we'd like him to learn more about the church. And so the dad does the thing that I think every boyfriend's worst nightmare would be, and he calls this kid up and says, hey, we need to talk, you should come over here. And I can only imagine the panic that he had. <laughs> And to his surprise, as he shows up to the house on his motorcycle, there's two Mormon missionaries sitting in the front yard. There was a lady we were able to, to track into on our mission, and she, she was as golden as they come. She was uh, prepared well before we even got to her door, and, and she was excited about being baptized right from the start. Um, the, the hard thing, though, to, to see was that as she began down this path towards baptism, the opposition in her life increased dramatically. So I live with uh, just a mom, single mom, and uh, it was really interesting to see how my mom, even though she had all these troubles, we always stayed pretty strong in the gospel. And once I went to Brazil, it was filled with that. I mean, it's there are tons of single mothers in Brazil. Then shortly after, he texted us saying he can't meet with us because his family would disown him, and so we, we were quite upset. But um, we kept trying, and we got back in contact with him. And um, I remember teaching him right after that experience, going to see him for the first time after he texted us. And um, him saying that he still wanted to learn even though he couldn't get baptized. For, for this woman, the gospel was a battle and, and I felt a, a little guilty going through that experience, realizing that I, I, I've never had to face anything like that, any kind of opposition really. I was, I was born and raised in the church. My family were, were strong members from when I was very young. And it was always easy to, to get to church, to be a member, and to, to see this lady who wanted it so, so very badly, to see her struggle so much made me, it humbled me quite, quite a bit to, to see that. I thought it was so awesome because I was able to teach so many. I was able to understand what they were going through and how the hardships that they were going through. I was able to help them understand that it can be better and that they can uh, 
do it. As we sat down and began talking, me and him just really clicked, and it seemed uh, like he, we could relate to each other really well. About uh, over a year later, I get a call from some other missionaries that are, are serving in our area, and they, they told me that she's getting ready to go through the temple, and she'd love me to, to go with her. Leaving the temple and seeing her, her happiness, I, I can easily say that that was, that was the best day of my mission. There was something about seeing that next step being taken, the, the, the chance to go through the temple and, and make even those, those higher covenants with the Heavenly Father was, was unbelievable. And, and the, the feelings that day were, were really indescribable. Just his heart um, and the way he grew and being a part of that was something that I loved. I remember thinking after that lesson, if nothing else went right, that just that one moment that lesson with him meant was all worth it at times where I thought, you know, maybe that's why I was sent to Paraguay. Uh, even if it was just for him, it'd be worth those two years. I moved to Oslo and I felt like the world had fallen out from underneath my feet. The people we were working with were homeless or uh, immigrants about to be deported. They were people who didn't uh, speak English or Norwegian. Um, they were people whose family wanted to kick them out because they were talking to us. Uh, there were people who had been raped and were trying to recover from that. And really being thrown into the fire that way, that's when I think I realized that Norway was absolutely where I had to be, that these were the people who I absolutely had to be with. I knew this family that the mom actually told us they lived in a little house that was maybe uh, 20 feet by 10 feet. It was just a little shack. And they literally had nothing other than a little bit of food each day to eat, a bed and a little cabinet with three little kids to support. And the dad would work every day and so would the mom. And the mom would go out with a big metal cart and push around in the hot sun all day collecting garbage. And she told us that the way she counted her blessings was by the amount of garbage she was able to pick up. That when she got a big load of garbage that she knew God was watching over her and her family so that she could recycle that trash for money and support them. And that always touched me to know, to hear her be so grateful for something so small that to us here, we just don't even understand. While I was serving in Arizona, they passed a new immigration law. And as a Spanish missionary, this was very concerning to me. Uh, a lot of the individuals that we taught, a lot of our investigators were illegal immigrants and a lot of the English members had problems with that. When I'd go on exchanges with English elders and we'd have dinners, they'd find out it's the Spanish mission and say, hey, how is this new law or um, how is the church view teaching uh, legal immigrants? And we say, you know, we don't ask and we're all sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. And I don't think all the members really agreed with that. It created some real issues for us. We had some investigators who we would be teaching and next time we'd go over to their house, their house would be empty. They'd have just picked up and left. Um, the ward suffered. We got a lot of fear. A lot of members didn't want to come out with us for fear of being associated with illegal immigrants. And uh, it really kind of put some pressure on us for a while. We had investigators, converts actually, that they were political prisoners in Cuba for over 20 years. And they came to Spain, no money, no job, looking constantly. But they were just so happy, especially when they found the gospel. I said, this is God's church. This is where I need to be. There were so many people that just lived on the streets. They didn't, they didn't have homes or, and those were some of the nicest people that we ever met. They just let you sit there and talk to them for a little bit. They weren't necessarily, you know, going to be baptized, but they appreciated the little things that we were doing. And they, they were wide open to tell you, they may be a mess, but those were some of the greatest people that I ever met. Well, before I left on the mission, my nephew was diagnosed with cancer, and he was in the hospital for a while, for a long time, going through chemotherapy and everything. And before I went on to my mission, I couldn't have a job or anything. I babysat my nephews um, because their parents always had to be at the hospital with their child that had chemotherapy and that was going through leukemia. He had a really deadly type of leukemia. And so when I was in the MTC, they actually, um, they said that, that he was cured. 
and I remember seeing the I remember seeing the video of them um they have this kind of hope bell that's in the hospital that they ring for all the patients that are cleared to go and it kind of gives hope to everyone else that's in there and I remember seeing that and it was it was really special to me you know I remember bawling in front of everyone and then um and then on the mission he ended up relapsing and it happened really hard and really fast and uh I still remember <clears throat> I still remember um we went into the church we were proselyting or something me and my companion and we had to go into the church to do something and the mission president was in the church with all, all these people he had some reunion there the mission president kind of kind of put his arm around me and he said hey you know um he said, can I talk to you? We ended up going into the other room and, and he told me that, that my nephew had passed away. Um, we wake up and we get a phone call from the zone leaders and they're just the area right next to us saying that there had been a mudslide and every house had been flooded up to the ceiling. So we didn't even put on our ties, we just stuck on white shirts and we And left. we noticed the power lines were swaying and like my first thought was wind and my second thought was, oh it's the ground. We found out that night that seven people had been killed in a car bomb in Oslo. So we asked the members to keep us updated and we went home and went to bed. When we woke up the next morning, we had a text saying that 70 people were dead. Everyone was pouring out of buildings and stuff, and it was pretty, pretty crowded on the streets. Um, everyone was trying to call their family and stuff. I hadn't seen much emotion from the Japanese people before that, but it wasn't until the next morning that we really heard uh, what had happened up in Sendai. And that was kind of devastating to everyone, because uh, we knew people from the MTC, Missionaries had families in Sendai. It was just very uh, overwhelming and scary. It was really tough to see actually. These people who have nothing and then the mudside happens and then everything they do have, all they do have, gets destroyed. All their furniture, their TVs. Luckily the houses didn't really get destroyed just because everything's made of like concrete, things like that. But it was pretty tough to see them not knowing what to do. After the earthquake, our mission got split up because of radiation scares um, and uh, we were sent to three different missions and it was really just kind of weird at first because um, you go to the Tokyo mission and then you make friends and become really close to the missionaries there and you're split up. The bomb had just been a distraction so that the killer could go out and shoot dozens of teenagers. Everywhere in the city there were flowers. That was the symbol that Norwegians had of their unity and their hope. So uh, our mission got to be reunited after a couple months and our mission president arranged for us to go up and do service up in Sendai um, and going up there was a very humbling experience to see the devastation from the tsunami or the tsunami had happened three months uh, prior to us going up and helping and it still looked like it had happened that same day. There was just so much debris and there were just cars everywhere and boats half a mile inland. And you couldn't go anywhere in the city without feeling the weight that was kind of bearing down on everyone. But it was incredibly humbling to see their response and to see them all come together to try and recover from what had been an awful attack. But it was a really good experience to see how unified the Japanese people are and how they definitely have a strong compassion for each other and for the needs of the people around them. They only took what they needed and whatever they had to spare they shared with the people around them. So it was very, very humbling to see that. A mission really does change the course of your life because the experiences you have, the people you meet, it opens your eyes to the challenges that are in the world and the way to overcome those challenges. Um, people think that missionaries are really disconnected from the world because we don't watch TV and we don't 
you know, get online or, or watch movies and things, and so we're not connected. But in a way, being on a mission ties you to the world in a much closer way because people open up to you and tell you about how they really feel and the challenges they're going through, and you can be someone who can really lift and strengthen the most downtrodden among us. I remember in the mission when he went through this relapse, I remember just praying and I was so worried about him. And I remember just feeling this feeling and, and just having kind of kind of a voice that, that would say, you will see him again. So I took that with me through my whole mission. Um, just knowing that I'd see him again and when he ended up passing away and it was hard for me I remember kneeling down and praying and I remember I remember hearing that voice again saying that I will see him again and that voice actually affected me and affected me for the rest of my mission and it really helped me to teach with power and authority to the people. As, as a missionary, you're trying to live as close as you can to the Lord, uh, closer than probably the rest of your life. And yet, you're still going to face challenges. You're still going to have those trials, even while you're on a mission. You're still going to face those struggles. But that, that's, that's such like life. You're going to come home from a mission. You're going to have these great experiences. You're going to go back. You're going to strive to do your best and be a, a full-time member of the church and be helping others out, try to fulfill a calling, later on raise a family. And yet, with all that you're trying to do with all that you're, you're, you're hoping to, to succeed in and you'll still have those struggles, you'll still have those trials regardless of if you're doing everything right you can and, and if, if a mission taught me one thing that was, that was really it that uh, you're always going to have struggles but you have the tools and, the, and the, the means to cope with that and to get through it and to, to endure to the end. The last lesson that I really felt like I learned on my mission and one that probably would have made it easier had I learned it at the very beginning, but in a lot of ways it, it couldn't come until the end, was really feeling a belief in the atonement of Jesus Christ. Probably the biggest lesson I learned was to trust God and to have faith in Him and His timing in answering prayers and also how he does it. Uh, there were times where I was frustrated, even to this day with, you know, why am I not getting what I asked for, or why has it not happened yet? But I've learned with time, uh, we just need to trust in him, and he'll take care of everything else. I remember sitting in his own conference, and uh, the mission president's wife aid had had the missionaries prepare a primary song. And it's, I know that my Savior loves me. And I remember standing up and singing that song. And at that moment, more than any I'd feel, felt in my life, that I remember that I knew that my Savior loved me, that He was real. And from that moment on, it changed my perspective on how Jesus Christ what the atonement meant in my life. And I think if I had learned any lesson on my mission, that was the biggest one for me. That was the single greatest lesson that I could have learned, was that Jesus Christ is, is my savior, that I know he lives, that I know he cares for us. He knows what we're going through. I think that's how God often works, that it isn't until you've made it through the fire that you can feel that relief and that healing. Missions are hard and you're out there for a time that you're supposed to be but when I was um, ready to go home I was ready to go home. It was my time I'd served and I knew that I had done everything I could so I was as ready as can be. And I was very happy to get back to my normal life to see my family just like everybody. It was definitely mixed emotions but I'd had so many cool experiences and met so many great people that I was definitely sad because I knew at that moment that I would never get this kind of experience again. I think that one of the best things missionaries can do that are coming home is just hit the, hit the ground running 
Uh, I remember just being home and it was about the next day that I was home and I was sick and my mom just woke me up and I was like, what am I gonna do today? And she's like, just go. I was like, go away. Uh, biggest yeah. blessing of all, she waited. I didn't have a 24 hour schedule set aside to serve others. And so the hardest transition is just learning a balance between taking time for yourself and your own success and your future family success and still looking for those opportunities to serve others even though it seems like you don't have any time to do so. I got to serve in two missions which is really cool because they're just so different. A Utah mission compared to an out of the country mission. Completely different. You know, it's, it's really cool to have everyone go and then you really, you learn stuff from your mission president and from your mission and you're like, okay, that's how it is. That's how it's supposed to be. And you get home and you talk to all your friends and everyone's mission's way different. And you're like, what the heck? Like, what's, what's going and, uh, on? That's... It's really cool to be home and, and to talk about uh, their experiences and what they learned compared to what I learned. And just to see how their missions kind of changed them in the ways that they needed to and then how the mission changed me and exactly what I needed to. It's a lot easier to change the situation than to really change yourself. Um, and it's when you come home and the situation's back where you see kind of how well you changed or uh, giving another challenge to continue to change. Because sometimes we think we're set in stone and that we can't change, but that's just an excuse because we're not set in stone. Our main goal in life is to change and that's what we need to do. You never get it. And once you do, God's going to say, you know what? You think you got it, but let's see. You know, let's change everything, and then we'll see if you really got it. The blessings from my mission will be a foundation for the rest of my life in that what I learned on my mission solidified my testimony of Jesus Christ. And I learned the importance of the small things on my mission that can make the biggest impact. Selflessness is the thing that is most important when it comes to being a Christian. Is not doing something so you can later get into the celestial kingdom, but just doing what Christ would do in whatever moment or situation you find yourself. There were definitely some, some low moments, but I, I'm confident in saying uh, as I return home and look back that it was, it was exactly what I needed. And it's, it's exactly, uh, the experiences are exactly what everyone else needs too that goes. Go on a mission. It will change your life. It is absolutely wonderful. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world.